Hello, good evening, good day, and welcome to the Ask Abhijit show where I take questions from you and I answer those questions. So to those of you who are new to the channel, welcome and thank you for joining. For those of you who are regular viewers, welcome back. Thank you for joining. And for those of you who don't know how to ask questions, you can ask me questions in the comments in any of, of, of the videos on my channel and use the hashtag Ask Abhijit so that I can find your question. That's how you ask your questions, right? With that said, let's see who all is there on the live chat. I can see Radha Apte, Lone Rider, Vishal, Natha, Jatin, Gupta, Payne, Sunita, Sopra, Kal, Bhairav, Harsh, Dubey, Nilab, Akash, Dobriyal, Tango, Charlie, Sushant, Gupta, Twilight, Sumit, Agarwal, Appleseed, Mahendra, Khati, Miguel Diaz, Khushi Rani, Reeve, Kalita, Sampriti, Goswami, Jay Dikshit, Ashish Kumar, Nisarg, Prasanna, Mahender, Manmat, Tiwari, Shubham, Aditya Shetty, Bibek, Haldar, Priya, Karan, uh, Akshit, Aditya, Saket, Katari, Deepak, Vivek, Kumar, Giri, Jigar, Pranav, Dhruv, Mark, Dhruv, Kumar, DK, Jai, Bharat, Nelly, uh, Reddy, Nellore, Nirbhai, Sharma, Bahu, Uday, Shashwat, Aman, George, Kishore, Pranav, Ishan, Geopolitical, Dubai, Kuldi, Patak, Mona Lisa, Sahu, Animish, Divyang, Swatantra, Kumar, Yadavansh, Purna, Lingam, Garvit Singh Chauhan, GOH, Vaibhav, Disposal, Email, Harsh Negi, Melvin, Rain, Vivek, Crazy Brain, Vladimir Zilis, Zelensky, Soman, Jetha, Jong Un, <laughs> Pamel Nandi, Deepesh, Hind, Se, Tavi Putras, Fapnil Mondal, Alpha, D Black, Urvesh, Atish, Ankush Nath, Sudhakar, Surajit, Swapnil Mishra, Tanuj, Shivang, Veer, Das, Karamchand Gandhi, <laughs> Akash, Kostub, Pankaj, Aryan Saini, Miguel Diaz again, Umkar, Animish, Tejas, Sushant Gupta, Chandan, Chaitanya, Lagiraho Online, Sampriti Goswami, Teja, Kapil, and lots and lots and lots of other people. So nice to have you all on this live chat. I am un un unfortunately, I cannot greet you all by name, but thank you so much for being on this. Krabby Feet, uh, Sonak, I'll take some more names, Praful, Jay Patel, Lord Arjun, Vinayak, Somnath Abhishek, Chulbul, Vivek Kumar Giri, and uh, everybody else, everybody else, Meban Kitlang, Khar, Kharbudon, Chirag Avasti, and everybody else. So, with that, uh, with that done, uh, let's uh, take some questions, right? Let's. Uh, I can see lots of people saying hello. Hello to you all. Hello to you all. All right. All right. Let's get into the into the heart of the matter. Let's take some questions. What's question number one? What is question number one? Okay, I don't really know how to read Bengali, so uh, I'll just go into the question. I would like to understand why only the tigers of the Sundarbans are traditionally man-eaters. <laughs> There, there are many folklores like due to the salty water they drink, etc. But I haven't seen any scientific report anywhere. Well, I am not sure that the tigers of the Sundarbans region drink salty water. Mm, that is not something that um, uh, that um, mammals or animals do. I mean, salt water mammals would probably swallow salty water, and all like whales and maybe crocodiles, which are not mammals, also do that. But uh, so let's let's see where is the where is the Sundarbans region? Yes, let's see where that is. Mm, let's go to the maps. Yes, today we are starting with the map. Where is the Sundarbans? So, we go to the east part of India, eastern part of India. It's it's in the uh, delta region of uh, unified Bengal, Bangladesh, yeah, which is mainly Bangladesh and also uh, parts of uh, Indian Bengal, yeah. So, we have the great Padma River or the, the Ganga, which drains into uh, the the Sea of Kalinga or the Bay of Bengal, whatever you want to call it, Indian Ocean. And there are various other tributaries, lots of rivers that also drain into this region. And this entire region is full of these mangrove forests and other forests. That's called the Sundarbans, right? Uh, and yes, there, there, this is this region is home to a whole lot of tigers. Uh, I'm not sure it's a very large tiger population, but yeah, one of the largest tiger populations that still survives in the world. Yeah, and yes, these tigers have this um, reputation of of uh, hunting people, yeah, of of killing people. That's why they are called man eaters. So why is this? Why is it that these tigers do that? Why do they have this reputation of being man eaters? First of all, this is a highly 
populated area. Uh, Bangladesh and, and Bengal have some of the highest population densities in the world. And lots of people live in the Sundarbans. People um, rely on the Sundarbans forests, uh, forest for uh, a variety of uh, purposes, for the livelihood, for gathering honey, for fishing, for other things. Yeah. So they venture out into the forest, so sometimes in small groups, sometimes alone. Yeah. So they, pr- they, they, they present a very tempting opportunity for these large cats. You know, for for a very for a cheap meal, typically a tiger has to work really hard for his or her meal. They have to hunt animals, and animals are really well adapted to trying to 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 evade tigers. So it's really hard work to get a decent meal. When you have these slow moving ape like creatures, human beings who can't really run <laughs> and who can't see in the dark, it's kind of really easy for a tiger to catch people such such prey. And typically tigers uh, don't do this, but once a tiger gets the taste of this and he or she realizes how easy it is to just hunt humans then they start doing that and once so i mean tigers are typically solitary cats they don't live in large social groups but yes one or two of them they learn this and maybe others would pick up pick it up from them especially if it's a mother who's teaching her kids her cubs how to hunt yeah and then that may be passed on from generation to generation. That sort of thing may happen. Yeah. So that's the reason why th- there are lots of these uh, these uh, scary stories of man-eating tigers in the Sundarbans region, in 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 Bengal, in unified Bengal, in overall the Bengal region. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not. I don't think all of the tigers there are man-eaters, but yes, human beings present a very tempting meal for tigers. And it's easy to hunt humans, uh, so so and and because of the high population density and all that, that's why it's uh, likely that this uh, phenomenon occurs there. But it's not like uh, only the tigers of the Sundarbans have been manators. We have uh, had reports of of manating tigers throughout the ages in India. I mean, even during the British occupation of India. Uh, you had the the so-called Corbett National Park. We still have this national park, which is called the Jim Corbett National Park. Jim Corbett was a poacher. He was a murderer of, of animals. And he was a foreign occupier. But we have named this national park after this fellow Jim Corbett, who is known for killing tigers. So during the time of Jim Corbett, when he was alive and he was, uh, yeah, well, he was there in northern India, uh, there were many reports of various tigers that had taken to to, to killing human beings, yeah? So and he he personally took out some of the, some of these tigers. This fellow Jim Corbett. So there are report there are reports from that region of tigers uh, turning to uh, killing human beings. There are reports of other animals also turning to killing human beings, like leopards. In, for instance, in in uh, Western India, in, in Mumbai, there is this uh, national park. I don't know what it's called. It's some strange name. Uh, there is this national park in Mumbai, <laughs> where there you have the largest, I mean, the highest population density of leopards probably in the world. And these leopards sometimes, uh, you know, they they prey on humans once in a while, because uh, well, it's easy. Yeah, humans are the slowest of the creatures they can hunt. Uh, typically, they go after goats and dogs and all that, and uh, usually sometimes deer also, and other small animals, but sometimes human beings. And uh, so th- that's what happens. In, it's not just leopards and, and tigers. Uh, I, I remember many, many, many years ago when I was a kid, I watched this movie. When I was a teenager or something, I watched a movie called The Ghost in the Darkness. Uh, it was a movie set in Kenya at the turn of the 19th century, 1920th century, late 19th century. And uh, it's about the construction of a ra- railroad in Kenya and Indian origin workers are involved. I think Om Puri was one of the actors. Yeah. So this movie, The Ghost of the Ghost and the Darkness, was about the this these two animals, these two lions. These two lions were siblings, brothers, and they were called the man eaters of Tsavo. So these lions also, it seems like they exclusively hunted human beings because it was so easy to, to catch to, to hunt humans. So this is a phenomenon you see across the world. Wherever you have big cats, once a big cat, whether it's, whether it's a lion or a tiger or, or any other large cat, once he or she realizes that it's that you can hunt humans and how easy it is, then they kind of you know get lazy and they uh, go on doing that because it makes sense, you know, less energy expenditure and almost like a guaranteed meal. So that's why large cats take to occasionally take to hunting human beings. So it's not like it's something that's exclusive to the tigers or the of the Sundarbans. It's not like it's exclusive to only tigers. I think lots of animals do this. Even bears, typically, they don't hunt humans. But there have been reports of bears, whether it is polar bears or those brown bears, the Klondike bears in Alaska or various other parts of, of, uh, of, the, of, the, of North America. Even bears in India. Sometimes you hear about bears attacking humans. Yeah. 
But typically it's when humans provoke them. So that's how it goes. It's not like the tigers of Sundarbans are exclusively manators or traditionally manators. It's just that it's happened because of the overpopulation of the region, the tigers shrinking habitat and the paucity of, of uh, the prey that they have resources to hunt. And that's why they sometimes take to, uh, to hunting or preying upon human beings. But it's not something that's exclusive to these tigers. All right. I hope that answers this question. Great question to start off with. What else do we have? Sri Ram Kannan says, I am from Singapore. The other day I was discussing with my school professor about the rise of Singapore. He said that Singapore had an iron man called Lee Kuan Yew who had harmonized Singapore again under one umbrella which had unified Singapore. He also said that colonialism in Singapore was a good thing that it had brought English which unified everyone under one language. He says, why can't India do the same? Uh, India should be unified under one language as well. I said that's not possible because of the cultural diversity and evolution. I would like to know your views on this matter. Do you think India can ever be unified wholly under a uh, language despite having a lot of diversity? India has always had a huge amount of diversity going back to Vedic times. It's not like uh, in, during the Vedic times when the Rig Veda was written, there was only one language Sanskrit. There must have been lots of languages spoken even then. But we have always had one unifying civilizational language. So people in various parts of India, they would have spoken, spoken various languages. But these languages are all in some way or the other interconnected, interrelated, and, and uh, in some way alike. And the common language that... that uh, unified everything was Sanskrit. That was always the link language, the civilizational language. That's the language that spread across Eurasia. Yeah. And so that's how it is. Now coming to Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew is a very interesting uh, person. Uh, clearly the great, uh, the grand master of Singapore, the, the great unifier of Singapore. He was first elected prime minister, I believe in 1959. Yeah. 1959. Uh, so where is Singapore? Let's go to the map once again. Where is the map? Singapore. So we know where India is. Let's go south, south, south. And we know where, where Malaysia is. Yes, the Malacca Strait, we all know, I believe, because you watch my channel, you know where the Malacca Strait is. So at the other end of the Malacca Strait, you have this island city called Singapore. It's a Singapore. It's a Sanskrit name. And you can see it's at the southern tip of Malaysia. Of course, you have another part of Malaysia on this island here, Kalimantan. Yeah, Borneo or whatever. So Singapore. So uh, there was a time when Singapore was unified with Malaysia and then there were various issues and this, the Singaporeans, uh, I think they left Malaysia. There was this partition or whatever you want to call it, secession of Singapore from Malaysia in the early 1960s. What, what year was it? 63, 65, somewhere around there. Look it up. Okay, I don't memorize dates. Uh, and Lee Kuan Yew was the prime minister of Singapore. He was... First elected 59, most likely. Then he was the prime minister of Singapore. Essentially the dictator of Singapore, you could say, from 1965 to, I think, 1990. In, even after 1990, he was the most powerful politician, but he did not have any official position after 1990, which actually is more suitable to being in, 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 in uh, power. You know, no responsibilities and, and a lot of power. So Sing what Lee Kuan Yew, Yew did is that he took Singapore out of, within a generation, within, let's say, 20 years, from the status of a third world country to a highly prosperous, highly developed first world nation with one of the highest rates of per capita GDP and one of the most um, amazing levels of prosperity anywhere in the world. He did this within a generation, within 20 years. So... 1960s, Singapore is a third world nation with slums and, 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 and broken down system and no infrastructure, nothing. By the 1980s, it is a highly prosperous first world country, very highly developed, huge booming economy, excellent prosperity. So Lee Kuan Yew uh, was a firm believer in the English language. Yeah, uh, Of course, he did resent colonialism to a certain extent, but uh, he was kind of an Anglophile. He... Uh, uh, he reformed Singapore. He instituted this very strong one-party system, essentially, essentially a one-party system, essentially a dictatorship, with a very strong focus on the economy, with a very strong, strong focus on social harmony. Singapore is is a is a city that's a melting pot of Indians and uh, Indians and and Chinese mainly, and uh, Malays also, the three main ethnicities. Yeah, so he harmonized them under this uh, umbrella of English. Yeah, social harmony, economic development education, very strong and very rigorous education for everybody and, and public housing, all these things. Yeah. 
So he did a superb job, a stupendous job of doing this. And the Chinese have tried to copy this. So Li Kuan Yew was a, an ethnic a Chinese person. So the Chinese Communist Party sent lots of officials to Singapore to study the methods of Singapore. And I think Deng Xiaoping used to say that if I have to transform Shanghai into Singapore, I can do it in a decade. But China is so enormous, it's, it's a huge struggle. So the same thing applies to India as well. It's very easy to transform a city-state, which is just one city. The smaller the system, the more complex can be your adjustments. But the larger the system, the simpler you have to keep things, the policies and all that. So, so Lee Kuan Yew had this wonderful set of policies that really worked. It totally transformed Singapore. Of course, there are complaints about authoritar authoritarianism, about the uh, imposed, uni you know, uh, unifying foreign language and all those things. It's it's very harsh. The rule is very harsh. The fines are very harsh, and the, the discipline is very harsh and all that. But overall, it's been it's worked out really great for the people of Singapore. Uh, so the question is, what about India? So so Lee Kuan Yew came to India a few times. He was actually, a, a, you could say, um, he was fond of India. I mean, if you read his books, I have a couple of his books lying around somewhere. Uh, he writes about India and he, he, sp he speaks about the caste system, that the caste system and all that is going to keep India back. And he recounts, he re recollects that he had visited um, India, New Delhi, and he remembers how shoddy the Rashtrapati Bhavan was. And uh, he's, he remember, I think he wrote about the fact that he asked Indira Gandhi, Madam and Mrs. Indira Gandhi, the, then Prime Minister of India, that your, the Indian people in Singapore are among the highest performing people in the world. Yeah, they contribute so much to Singapore and, and Indians elsewhere also, con they, they uh, stand out among all other ethnic groups. So why can't you do something in India that will unleash the potential of India? Yeah. And the answer from uh, Mrs. Gandhi was like, no, this is the way it's going to be in India. Some, something to, to that, to that uh, effect. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember the name of the book, but uh, I have it uh, somewhere. Yeah. So that's what he said. So the thing is that it's really easy to turn around a small nation, a city state in a decade, in two decades, very easy. Yeah. But the larger the system is, the more inertia and resistance it has from within, especially in the so-called federal system that we have, where you have so many different centers of political power and one center of uh, central power, centralized power, which is not that powerful overall. It's very complicated. The kind of system we have created after 1947, right? The setup that we have created is designed to prevent any rapid progress. That's how it is. But it's, it's certainly something that can be worked upon. And the more you change it, the faster the change will happen. But overall, the Chinese tried to emulate the Singaporean system. And now you can see that it's kind of working to a certain extent. It takes a long time in a large country. Yeah. I mean, if you have, let's say you have a helicopter. No, forget a helicopter. Let's say you have a drone that's the size of my hand. You want to turn it around, make it flip. It can flip very fast. But let's say you have the, a drone the size of a building. You want to make it flip. It's going to take a long time to slowly flip around. Yeah, that's how it goes. Any physical system, including any political system, the larger it is, the slower it will move around. That's how it is. So it's certainly something that we can uh, take inspiration from, uh, the kind of reforms and policies that uh, Lee Kuan Yew adopted. I do not agree with the fact that English should be the unifying uh, uh, unifying factor for India. We are a 10,000 plus year old civilization. Our unifying language, our civilization language has always been Sanskrit. Today, they, they have created an enormous amount of opposition to Sanskrit in India. And this is something that has been created over the past 100 years, especially after 1947, especially after the 1960s, the political opposition to Sanskrit from all quarters, all kinds of quarters. Yeah. So it's going to be an uphill battle. Battle for India. But eventually, if India is to regain its its civilizational status as one of the, as the preeminent civilization, it has to come back under Sanskrit, not English. English is the language of the oppressor, the colon, colonizer. Right now we use it. That's fine. We use it against them. That, that's all right. But eventually we have to return to Sanskrit. That is the one unifying language we can have. English is, is, a, is a stop gap solution and it's not the right solution. So yes, India can certainly be unified under one language, but that, that language cannot be English. It has to be Sanskrit. It has always been Sanskrit. Yeah, it is, it is certainly possible. We have enormous an enormous amount of cultural diversity and all that. You go to, even within a certain state, let's say Odisha, you go from Northern Odisha, Uttar Kalinga, Utkal, and you go to Southern Odisha, the cuisine changes, the dialect, the, the, the way of speaking changes, the way of dressing changes, everything changes, right? So it's, 
it's it's so beautiful to have so much diversity and yet we have always been one civilization extending all the way to indonesia and the philippines and all that so the unifying factor was dharma the dharmic culture and sanskrit so that's where india has to go back maybe it will take 20 years maybe 50 years maybe 100 years but that's the direction in which india has to go if it as it has to ever like people keep on saying akhand bharat or 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 uh, uh, what do they say uh, transforming india into bharat or making India the Vishwa Guru, or making India the superpower, it will not happen as long as we promote English as the link language. English is a foreign language. It's the it's the it's one of the worst remnants of colonialism. Yeah, and people like me are most comfortable in English. That's that's the that's what's been done to us. Yeah, so English has to go. But yes, we can certainly be unified wholly under one language. That can only happen under Sanskrit. Even Hindi is not the right language. Yeah. The Hindi is an art, I mean, it's a very recent language. It's a it's a mongrel language, a mixture, you know, like they say in Hindi, Hindi khichdi of various things like like various Turkic dialects and some Arabic, some Persian with uh, overall the structure and, and syntax, the structure, the grammatical structure of Sanskrit with the vocabulary of all these foreign languages. That's what Hindi is. Hindi is something that emerged out of the uh, Turkic court, the Mughal, so-called Mughal court. And I, eventually Hindi has to be phased out. Hindi is not the right language to unify India. I don't know who decided and why they decided to use Hindi. I think it was the great magnificent Mr. Nehru who did that. So Hindi eventually has to go. It can only be Sanskrit as if India has to rise again. Not English, not Hindi. It has to be Sanskrit. And I know... I, I, I am I'm sure I can I mean I can imagine what kind of comments in in the chat will be going on right now, but that's fine. This is my view, and that's the only way forward. Okay, Shapat Chaudhary says, <clears throat> I am from Chittagong, Bangladesh, Chattogram. I'd like to know, I'd like to ask about the contribution so far of the whole Bengali people from the period of the time period of the epic itihasa, such as Ramayana and Mahabharata until the present day. It saddens me now to read about my own culture from so-called history textbooks referred to us in the school, where they speak very less about Bengal. Also, I would like to ask uh, how effective it will be to install a new mandatory law for the foreigners to learn our national language first, starting from Sanskrit, of course, whenever they intend to come to any countries in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, because I'm asking because we have this unfortunate status right now where people must speak English for them to understand. And also, I believe language plays a big role in our identity and our address as a nation. For example, Punjabi, Marathi, Bengali, Tamil, French, German, etc. They are known from respective places for the mother tongue they speak. Okay, right. My thoughts. So first of all, let's speak about the, the people of Bengal. So uh, Bengal is, is a wonderful place. It's got this incredibly rich wonderful history that, that dates back to the beginning of India itself, right? Bengal is not some separate place and the Bengalis are some separate people. It's never been that way, right? So we know where Bengal is. Do I have to put it in the map? Let's do it in case. <laughs> All right. We know where Bengal is, you know. Uh, Bengal has been partitioned into India and East Pakistan. That was then. It all went happened with the partition in the early 20th century by one of the English guys. Curzon, was it? Whoever it was. And then today we have Bangladesh and, and uh, West Bengal. But this entire region was once called Vanga or Anga. So once we had the kingdom of Anga, which was ruled by the Kuru dynasty, the Anga Mahajanapada. And the people of this Mahajanapada, the great republic, we have to call the Angayas, right? And the Mahajanapada era uh, dates back to the late Vedic era itself, right? The Vedic era is many thousands of years old. So we had the great Anga Mahajanapada, right? Then we had various kingdoms uh, in this region, kingdoms like uh, Suhma, Suhma kingdom of the late Vedic period. We had uh, the Pundra kingdom of the Mahabharata era, Pundra Vardhana, yeah, which uh, lasted all the way to the Mauryan times. Uh, the infamous incident of uh, King of Emperor Ashok executing, ordering the execution of eighteen thousand Ajivikas happened in Pundra, right? Then obviously we 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 have the Vanga kingdom which is mentioned in the Mahabharata, in the, in the Ramayana, uh, in the Arthashastra of Chanakya as well. Yeah, So you can see the oldest period is the Ram, is the Vedic period, then you have the Ramayana period, then then I would say the Mahajanapada's period, then the which would have included the Mahabharata more or less. And then we have the Mauryan era and the modern era. Right? So the Vanga kingdom is mentioned in the Ramayana, in the Mahabharata, in the Arthashastra. The Anga kingdom is mentioned, is one of was one of the great Mahajanapadas. So you can see how ancient the history is, right? So um, uh, then you, this region was from various uh, in during various uh, time periods part of the uh, 
Mauryan Empire, part of the Gupta Empire. Then you had the great Gouda Kingdom, right? Gouda Kingdom from about, from roughly the third from the 4th century AD to the middle of the 7th century AD. Yeah, uh, The last king was the great king Shashank who died in the middle of the 7th century AD or so. And then there was a period of uh, about a century of complete anarchy and chaos. Matsyanyaya, that's what it was called. And then you had the advent of the Pala Empire. The founder was Gopala I, who was democratically elected by the people to put an end to the Matsya Nai, to the chaos and anarchy. And the TV people themselves elected this guy democratically as the king of the of, of the Vanga region, Gopal. And he was the founder of the Pal Empire from the middle of the 8th century AD. And it lasted for about uh, maybe 400 years, roughly, that sort of thing. So that's the kind of history this region has had. It's always been the history of Bengal is intrinsically related to the entire history of the entirety of India. It dates back to the Vedic times, the Ramayan times, the Mahabharata times, the Mahajanapada era, the Mauryan era, the the um, the Mauryan empire, the Gupta empire, then you had all that. So it's it's a very rich, beautiful history. It was it it historically was one of the most rich, the, one of the most prosperous, one of the richest and fertile and abundant regions of India. Beautiful culture, excellent education. The great Vikramashila Mahavihar or, or uh, the great Vikramashila University is in Bengal. It's ruined Sarin Bengal. Everything is ruined now. Yeah, It's not in present day Bangladesh, Bangladesh, if I'm not mistaken. Beautiful history, very rich history. And then you had the, you had the destruction of Nalanda and the Turkic conquest of the region. Yeah. And then things go south, and today we have Bangladesh and West Bengal, and let's let's uh, end it there. <laughs> so, uh, what's the other question? Yeah, the question is how effective would it be to install a new mandatory law for foreigners to learn our national language, starting with Sanskrit, for countries in the Indian subcontinent? I don't think Pakistan would ever agree to making Sanskrit the mandatory language. <laughs> I don't think Afghanistan would make it. Would 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 uh, ever agree to that. I'm not sure even Bangladesh would agree to that. I'm not sure even West Bengal would agree to Sanskrit. That's the problem. That's the problem. That's the unfortunate status we, that we have right now. We are so deeply divided within, within ourselves. Even within India, we are so divided. But eventually this has to happen. We need to have a single unifying civilization language, which is the and the only one that, is, that can fit the bill is Sanskrit. It's the oldest language. It is also an extremely adaptable language and a very scientific and modern language. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that needs to happen eventually. But Bengal is a wonderful place. Beautiful, incredibly rich and complex history. And it's kind of sad to, to see the direction it went in in the past 1,000 years, which is something that happened to the entirety of India. The, the millennium of humiliation. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's, about, that's about Bengal. Yes. Right, let's take some questions about science for a change. We hardly talk about science these days, yes? So let's see some questions about science. Ishika says, can we say that there, wo, there is no matter without time and there is no time without matter? As we consider the birth of the universe uh, uh, to be when time started. Interesting question. So yes, the universe begins with what we call the Big Bang. Yes, the, the, we initially had a, a singularity or something close to a singularity, and then it expanded outwards. It expanded. There was this expansion of space-time. Uh, and that's that's the beginning of, the beginning of time. So the moment of the Big Bang, or the, or the Big Bang itself, is when time started from t equal to zero, and then it, it goes on forward. So, uh, so yes, initially the universe was just pure energy at the instant of the Big Bang, and then eventually the energy coalesced into massive particles and all that. That's a whole long story. Yeah, It happened in the very initial moments after the Big Bang. So initially, it's pure energy, most likely just photons and gravitons and all that. Um, so that's how it was. So time has always coexisted with mass energy. And you could also say that mass energy has also coexisted with time. But the question is, what happened before the Big Bang? And we don't quite have the answer. Nobody has an answer. Uh, there are people like Roger Penrose who have spoken about this, uh, the, the concept of eons. Eons, yeah. Uh, conforming cyclic cosmology. That's uh, that's his theory. Penrose, Hammerhoff. Uh, so I'm not sure. I've not really studied that. So I'm not sure what the concept of time is that when you go back in time to 
before the big bang or after the big crunch or whatever it is so yeah typically time and mass energy they go together yeah um, but we don't quite know what time is is it something that only that that, that, is, that is an artifact of our consciousness is it is it something we imagine or is it something that emerges out of the fabric of space time or, or is it something that like like in quantum mechanics time is an external parameter in quantum mechanics time is a classical parameter yeah so is time something that's external to our universe as well or is it something else entirely does it emerge out of uh, decoherence or does it emerge out of entanglement quantum entanglement no one knows yet there are lots of theories that people are struggling with but we don't quite know time what time is so yes as far as we we are concerned from whatever we understand time and mass energy have always gone together why do i say mass energy because mass and energy are essentially equivalent e equals mc squared which is one of the most uh, fundamental equations in in modern physics like they say yeah 1900 Five was it? Whichever year, yeah. So yeah, that's the deal. That's the deal. They just says, are black holes therefore eternity? Do how do they follow the law of conservation of energy? Black holes are something that people really find scary, right? These vacuum vacuum cleaners which suck everything in, which is not quite the case. Black holes are just well, you could think of them as pure mass, and they take various forms. You know, the rotating, non-rotating black holes, unrotating, uncharged black holes, like the Schwarzschild black holes. Then you have the various other kinds of black holes, uh, charged black holes, rot uh, rotating black holes, rotating and charged black holes, extremal black holes, all all that. So, are black holes eternal? Are they infinite? Are they? Do they live forever? Well, not quite the case. Uh, the smaller a black hole is, the hotter it is. So it's a thermodynamic object, and a hot object is going to radiate stuff. So a black hole actually radiates mass energy. Yeah, and if it radiates mass energy, then it's going to shrink in size. This is what we call Hawking radiation or black hole evaporation. So as a black hole uh, evaporates, if if its temperature is higher than the temperature of the universe, which is uh, uh, what is it, the the cosmic microwave background radiation temperature, then the black hole will evaporate and shrink. And the smaller it gets, the faster it it evaporates. And eventually, it explodes and go and disappears into nothingness. So black holes are not necessarily eternal. How do they follow the conservation law of conservation of energy? Because the black hole has a mass yeah and that mass is conserved that mass doesn't disappear anywhere yeah uh, when a black hole accretes something when it swallows a star the mass of the star is added to the star to, to the mass of the black hole so the mass is conserved when a black hole radiates energy hawking radiation you can calculate how much energy is radiated and that is subtracted from the mass when two black holes merge there is this enormous gravitational wave tsunami which takes away some of the mass so the resulting black hole is not quite the sum of the masses of the two black holes but you can but it it overall it all adds up and energy and mass are conserved mass and energy are essentially equivalent yeah so that's how it is so black holes are not necessarily eternal large black holes supermassive black holes you could say are eternal because uh, they are colder than the temperature of the universe the temperature of deep space the cmbr temperature and that's why they they get, they get larger over time the accrete radiation and their lifetime essentially exceeds the lifetime of the universe itself 13.8 billion years so large sufficiently large black holes are essentially eternal more or less eventually as the universe expands it, it will get it will get colder and then those black holes will become hotter than the the temperature of the universe but that's how it is so black, black holes are not necessarily eternal and they certainly do follow the law of conservation of mass and energy krishnan says the cultural symbol of china is the dragon the dragon so what's the cultural symbol of india is it the indian elephant lion tiger or peacock uh, yes the cultural symbol so to say of china is indeed the dragon this uh, this imaginary beast which is like a snake that flies or 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 a great lizard which with wings that you know, when claws and talons talons like like an eagle and uh, i suppose it it can uh, spit fire as well yeah so that's the the mythical uh, creature imaginary creature that is the symbol of china what's the cultural symbol of india well the cultural symbol of india is something that's up for debate everything in india is up for debate they even debate whether india is a nation or a civilization or an idea yeah <laughs> uh, so everything is up for de debate it doesn't necessarily have to be an animal yeah so when it comes to various other nations well russia's symbol is the bear isn't it kind of it's the unofficial national symbol of russia the bear for for the us it's that 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 fierce and evil looking eagle which is kind of appropriate the the bald eagle 
Um, for Wales, it's 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 some kind of a dragon again. For England, what's yeah the three lions that they have on their crest or something like that. So every nation has, has, has some symbols. For India, uh, the West tries to portray India as an elephant to show India as a slow moving, sleepy creature. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, one could associate the elef- uh, the the tiger with India for for sure because it's something that's uh, India has the largest population of tigers and historically always has, has had that. Yeah. So it could be the tiger, the peacock. Well, yeah, it's the national bird of India, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm not mistaken, the peacock. But yeah, it's it's a, it's not quite appropriate to have the peacock. You know, this harmless little, pretty little bird. Not little, but pretty bird as the symbol of a nation. We need to have something fiercer. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an animal. Uh, the swastik, the, the symbol, the swastik symbol, the holy auspicious swastik symbol, could be the national symbol of India. It's something that's been associated with India since the days of of the Indus, the Saraswati Sindhu period of our history. Yeah. So the swastik could be that. The Om symbol could be that. Yeah. We could also have the Dharma Chakra, which is something that's uh, that's common to all the Dharmic paths. Yeah. The Dharma Chakra. We also have the Ashoka, so the the lion standard of Ashoka, which is not bad. Lions, we like lions, yeah. So it could be any of those things. I don't think there is any consensus. We keep on arguing and debating about everything. We should have something that is not that 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 portrays, that evokes uh, some majesty and power, not something that's sleepy and slow like an elephant, not something that's pretty and harmless like a peacock. It could be possibly, uh, possibly the tiger, possibly the, the three lion uh, standard of. Uh, of Ashok or something that is uh, something like the swastika or, or, the, or the Om symbol or the Dharma Chakra. I think uh, eventually we need, we need to find some, some consensus on this. Maybe the tiger, the Bangladeshis t- try to claim that the tiger is their national symbol. Well, that's all right, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. So yeah, I, I'm not sure what the symbol is. We have so many symbols. We are the oldest civilization. We have been around for more than 10,000 years. Yeah. So a civilization a civilization that's that old is going to have a whole lot of symbolism, you know, s- symbols associated with it. So if you want to pick just one symbol, then maybe we should have a nationwide poll in which case many weird things will come into the picture also. <laughs> that's how, how it is. We, we have too much democracy. We have too much debate. We keep on arguing about pointless things. We should settle on one great symbol, majestic symbol, maybe the tiger, maybe the Ashok lion standard and make that the official symbol of India. Yes. Okay, let's go into geopolitics now. Hardik says, India has recently fast-tracked work, work for a 11 gigawatt hydropower dam on the Siang River, which is a tributary of the Brahmaputra of Arunachal, just 100 to 150 kilometers from a Chinese 60 gigawatt dam, which is in Chinese-occupied Tibet, north of the region. Considering the overall cost of 1.13 lakh crore rupees for this dam project, how do you see this move by the government? Do you believe that China and India might go to war in the future for fresh water resources of Tibet? Right, good question. So let's look at the region. Where is this region? Uh, uh, I'm not sure where exactly this is, but you can see this enormous massive river, the Brahmaputra over here. And you don't see much of it coming in from, t- from Tibet. So more than 80% of the waters of the Brahmaputra, they originate in the forests of Arunachal Pradesh. Yeah. So if the Chinese cut off the, the, the Yarlong Tsangpo word, which is the Tibetan word for, uh, Tibetan name for Brahmaputra, and they divert it, it's not going to cause any major problems for India or for Bangladesh or, or, or yeah, it's not going to cause any major problems. The thing is that they are damming up the river upstream. The river originates in the Tibetan plateau and then it flows southwards. It's, it enters Arunachal Pradesh and flows through Assam, eventually into Bangladesh, where it merges with the Ganga, it becomes the Padma, and it flows into the uh, Sea of Kalinga or the Bay of Bengal. So why is India constructing this large dam, hydropower dam, on this, this uh, tributary of the, of, the, uh, of the Brahmaputra? Just... 100 to 150 kilometers from the Chinese dam. There are reasons for this. And it's not about... uh, The reason is very simple. See, if the Chinese divert away all the water, we are fine with it. Because most of the water of the river comes from Arunachal. The danger 
is that the Chinese may, may do a sudden release of water, which may cause a shockingly large, massive flash flooding in lower lying uh, in uh, southern regions like in India and uh, Arunachal or Assam or elsewhere, which could cause catastrophic damage to India. That is the real danger. And the Chinese have tried such dirty tricks in the past. In the early 2000s, maybe 2003, 2000, 2004, they had dammed up a river called the pa Parichu River somewhere in, where was it? Arunachal? Was it Ladakh? Somewhere in, in along the Tibet border. And uh, yeah, there was a danger that this artificial dam would be broken and the entire... Uh, it would cause an enormous amount of flooding and kill lots of people. So when a nation controls territory that's that's upstream and at a higher altitude, there's always the danger that they can release water suddenly without warning and cause catastrophic damage to your territories and, and kill lots of people. So if India builds a large enough dam, uh, south of, of the Chinese dam, then if the Chinese release water without informing us, then we can catch it and we can mitigate the, the potential catastrophic impact of this thing. So I, I believe that the uh, 11 gigawatt hydropower dam we are building is, is going to be a dam that can take care of such an eventuality. Yeah, If there is a sudden release of water, this dam will be able to absorb much of it and the overall impact downstream will not be what otherwise it would be. So that I believe is one of the major reasons why this dam is being constructed close, reasonably close to the Chinese dam in uh, occupied Tibet. Yeah, And of course it's going to generate hydroelectricity for us and all that. So, so that's the deal. The other question is, do you believe that China and India may go to war in the future for fresh water resources of Tibet? I don't think so. Because most of the water, like I said, in the Brahmaputra originates in Arunachal Pradesh itself. So even if the Chinese completely divert the river, still more than 80% of the river uh, water if of the Brahmaputra will keep on flowing. So that's fine. So I don't think it's something that could lead to war. There are certain Indian so-called geopolitical commentators, including very senior people who are scaremongering right now. You go to Twitter and see certain accounts. I'll not name them because I, there's no need for that. But there are people including very senior people who have written books, who are scaremongering, who are trying to create this, this uh, sense of panic in India, that the Chinese are, 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 are indulging in, in water warfare against India. And one of the, some of these authors have written books about, about Chinese rivers and all that. So, mm -mm -mm. yeah. So overall, I don't think it's, uh, if the Chinese divert it, it's a problem. The only danger is if they play these dirty tricks and release water all of a sudden without warning. So that's why we need to have dams that can absorb the impact of such unforeseen, malicious, sudden releases of water by China. Because the Chinese, we know that they can't be trusted. They they can play any trick on us and they can blame the weather. They can make any, any kind of excuse. So that's the primary reason, I believe, why this dam is being constructed. James Stevenson says, Tibet never conquered China. LOL. Oh my goodness. Tibet never conquered China. Well, James Stevenson has decided that Tibet never conquered China. I, I'm sure this is a comment from one of my older videos where I must have said that Tibet conquered China. So what are the facts? So um, so let's, let's see what, what the facts are, right? There was a Tibetan king, Tibetan emperor called Trisong Detsen who lived in the 8th and 9th centuries AD, who did conquer China. So, Mr. James Stephenson, I need to educate you about this. Let's say put something on, on the screen, yes. Uh, let's begin with Wikipedia. As always, the statutory warning to everybody, my friends, is that don't trust Wikipedia, especially when it comes to Indian history. But I am putting this on the screen just for reference, because even Wikipedia is telling the, telling the truth in this case. So, let's put this on the screen, yes. There is this article on Wikipedia about the Tibetan Empire. Tibetan Empire and uh, all that. So there's a map here, Tibet's influence on, on the region. Uh, let's go to history and let's go to the reign of Trisong Detsen. This Trisong Detsen is 756 AD to 797 AD. Uh, so this guy was crowned emperor with the name Trisong Detsen. He took control of the government when he attained his majority, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, in 755 china had begun to be weakened because of the anshi rebellion started by an lushan in 751 ad which would last until 763 ad almost uh, more than a decade uh Three Song Datsan's reign was characterized by the reassertion, reassertion of Tibetan influence in Central Asia. Uh, regions to the west of Tibet paid homage to the Tibetan court. From that time onwards, the Tibetans pressed into the territory of the Tang emperors, reaching the Chinese capital Chang'an, which is modern-day Xi'an, in late 763 AD. Tibetan troops under the command of whoever occupied Chang'an for 15 days and installed a puppet emperor, while the other emperor was in Luoyang. Nanchao and Yunnan and all that remained under Tibetan control from 750 to 794 uh, and so on. And eventually they turned on the Tibetan overlords and in, helped the Chinese inflict uh, defeat on the Tibetans. So Trisong Detsen conquered China and he took the capital city Chang'an, modern day Xi'an. Some people will say that but they did not take, they, he did not take Beijing. Well, Beijing was not the capital at the time. Chang'an was the capital. Okay, so this is about Trisong Datsun. You can look into it. What was Chang'an? Chang'an is present day Xi'an. Chang'an is one of the oldest cities in China. Uh, the the first emperor of China. Uh, what was his name? Qin Shi Huang or King Shi Huangdi. Let's see. It's written here. Wait, 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 wait. It'll be written here. Here you go. Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. His imperial court was just north of the modern day city of Xi'an yeah so uh it essentially has been the one of the oldest capitals of China it was certainly the capital of China during the time of the Tibetan invasion yeah and the the, the famous terracotta army of the Chinese emperor King Shi Huang Huang is is in a mausoleum right outside this city yeah so this was the old historical capital of China, Chang'an. This is the capital that the Tibetans conquered. They installed a puppet emperor over here under the leadership of the uh, Tibetan emperor Trisong Detsen. So, uh, uh, dear James Stephenson, unfortunately, <laughs> LOL, but yeah, it's it's not quite the case. The Tibetans did indeed conquer China. You can certainly study more about it. Yeah, it's all out there in the public domain. I don't understand why people just when they come across some new information, they are not ready to fact check it or verify it, do a simple Google search. They will simply take the time to write a comment and say, LOL, it never happened. Look it up. It happened. <laughs> All right, next. Radha Opte says, if India carries out a military operation to take back POK, Pakistan occupied Kashmir, what will be the reaction of the European Union, especially of America? The reaction will be that of anger and they will take action. See, Pakistan is a vital territory that is controlled by the West. It has been created artificially for a certain geopolitical purposes, which are still being served. Let's take a look at the map. Uh, yeah, sorry. Let me put that on the, 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 on the screen. Here is the map. Here we are. So this nation was artificially created by the West, by the British, to cut India off from Central Asia. And because Jammu and Kashmir had acceded to India, they had to ensure that some parts of Jammu and Kashmir also went to Pakistan. And that's how we have been cut off temporarily for now from Afghanistan and Tajikistan and the rest of Central Asia. This was part of the great game, right? So if India takes back POK, India will regain access to Central Asia which is not good from the eyes of the West because it's going to create a whole domino effect. You know, the see, essentially, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, all these nations are Russia's strategic backyard. It's part of Russia's exclusive zone of, uh, of uh, influence. Russia has routine military exercises with, with all these nations. So if India can access Afghanistan and Tajikistan, then the Russians can build, you know, infrastructure through the region and they can start accessing the warm waters of the Indian Ocean, which is something the Russians have for centuries wished to do, right? And obviously India will have to take more than POK back because the Wakhan Corridor is a very mountainous region. We'll need to take essentially northern Pakistan back, which uh, needs to happen anyway. So that would be a disaster from the West, for, for the West, from their perspective. So if India today carries out a military operation, the West will impose sanctions on India. They will portray us as war mongers. In 1971, George W. George H. W. Bush, the senior Bush, who was then the, was a senior official at the time, he 
called India a war mongering nation in 1971. I have seen an old copy of Time magazine or Newsweek or whatever in which India was portrayed as a war as a war monger. In the words of George Bush, the senior George Bush, in 1971, when India was fighting a just war. It was we have, we had gone to war for just causes. It was a war initiated by Pakistan, and still they were calling us war mongers. So if initi India initiates something, imagine what they will call us. They will most likely impose sanctions on, on India the way they have imposed on Russia. They may even send aircraft carrier strike groups, and you know who knows what they will do. So right now it is not the right time for this to happen. We need to ensure that uh, we need to do this when the when the taking back of POK becomes inevitable. You don't do something when there is a high chance or, or a high probability of, of uh, not succeeding. You do something when you are certain of succeeding. That's when you do it. So we have to engineer a situation, a geopolitical situation, where we are so powerful that it is inevitable that we will take it. It should fall into our lap without us even fighting for it. That's what we need to do. The 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 mark of a true leader is that he or she wins without fighting and nobody even realizes what happened. That is the greatest victory. When you win without, without firing a single shot. So India has to maneuver itself into a position over the next decade or whatever, where it is inevitable that this happens. We don't want to carry out a military operation. It should come back to us on its own. So we have to rise to that status where the people of Pakistan, people of POK, start clamoring and begging to be reintegrated with India. Of course, we don't want to reintegrate the whole of Pakistan right now. That may take another 50 or 100 years because of the extreme radicalization there. But POK in northern Pakistan is necessary. We need it back. Yeah for geostrategic purposes, for geostrategic reasons. So uh, right now is not the right time for this. In the future, things will change. This is a, dec a decade of very rapid change. We're going to see very rapid geopolitical changes in this decade. And we need to ensure that we rise economically and militarily over this decade. And I think by the time this decade, decade is out, if we play our cards right, then this could become more or less inevitable. So that's what needs to happen. We don't need to jump the gun and do something which is hasty and ill-advised and when it's not the right time to do it. We need to be a little patient. It's not going to take a lot of time for us to retake POK and and uh, achieve our geopolitical objectives. You know, And these are just causes. These are our territories. They have been our territories for 10,000 years. So it's not like we are stealing someone's territory and doing something wrong. Right. Somnath Abhishek says, in yesterday's Indian Interest podcast, you mentioned about having kids in the early 20s. What's your opinion on the cost of living of sustaining a family in one's early 20s? Very good question. Most people in this age don't even earn a good primary school annual fees in a month. Also, population is one of the reasons why cost of living competition is increasing in our country. So yesterday, I went into detail about this. I gave the example of China. I analyzed the example of China and how their one-child policy has caused it has it has begun to cause a demographic disaster and now the people have kind of given up they are protesting passively against the chinese government by refusing to have children it's going to cause a terrible population crash in the future the population's average age is going to be going to the 50s and 60s eventually which is a disaster for any country most people is going to are going to be old which is it's a disaster so we don't want to go in that direction for that, our birth rate, the total fertility rate should be at least 2.1. We have dropped below that. It's 2 now, or maybe less. So we are slowly going in that direction. The window of demographic opportunity for India is up to 2050. Now, so that's why I said that we do certainly need to reduce the population, but it should not happen in an artificial and hasty manner. We should do it over a century or two centuries. This is the long-term game. Our plans need to be measured in centuries. We have to be patient. We are a 10,000 plus year old civilization. A century is nothing for us. Yeah, many things won't happen in our lifetime, but they will happen in the lifetime of our descendants. So that's what we have to work, work for. We are links in a chain and we have to do, we have to show, make sure that we are strong links. Our part is done properly. So now the question is a very good question. I said yesterday that the optimum thing to do is for young people to have their children two children or whatever they want to have, at least two, I would say, in their early 20s. So that by the time you're in, you're in your early 40s, when you're at the peak of your career, your kids have grown up. Yes? And then you can truly focus on your career and through through your whatever you do in your career, you can uh, help the country. 
yeah, and, and help India grow. That's what we need. You reach the peak of your abilities in career, in life, in the 40s. In the 20s and 30s, you're still learning as you go. You're not really all, all grown up. That's how it goes. Yeah. So, so I said, you should have your kids in your early 20s and then get on with life. Don't wait until you're in the 30s or 40s to have kids. It's, it's kind of late. It's going to exhaust you. Kids, it takes a lot of energy and effort to raise kids. The question is a very good one that most people who are young in their 20s don't have much of an income. They are still struggling to find some, some way in life. And if you have kids, how are you going to pay afford afford to pay for them? So I the, the solution is this, that you need to rely on your parents, on your families. So we have always had this extended family system, which is why all, the kids were always very well taken care of. Now today, unfortunately, in this post-colonial or still colonized India, there are only a few centers of development in the country. Certain tier one metropolitan cities, uh, Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai, uh, Hyderabad, Chennai, and all. And there are some tier two cities, there are tier three cities also coming up. But opportunities are few. So people are forced to migrate from wherever they live to some large city. And then that's that's causing this phenomenon of these nuclear families or, or whatever. Uh, so what needs to happen is India needs to develop so that tier two, tier three cities also develop and you people can stay with their parents and have the same opportunities that other people have in their own uh, hometowns. And it's perfectly fine, I would say, to stay with your parents in your 20s, even in your mid-30s. Yeah, If you can do that, then at least your children are in a safe space. Of course, I'm... I'm Assuming your parents allow this, in the US, by the time you're 18, your parents will throw you out. That's why the, the American society is so broken. US society is so broken because there is no such thing as a family system. Once you're 18, your parents will throw you out on the streets. Doesn't matter what happens. Just live in your car if you don't have a if you can't afford to have an apartment. That's not how a civilized society behaves. And I'm, I'm sad to sorry to say this. Yeah. So the problems are being caused by the breakdown of the family system, the extended family system. You don't need to live in the same house as your parents. You can live nearby and whenever you're working, you can drop off your kids with your parents. The grandparents love to be around grandkids, mostly, most, I would say. <laughs> yeah. So the, the solution is that we have to rely on our extended families, especially the elders. That's what needs to happen. We need to ensure that our family system, which has evolved over thousands of years, stays intact. We don't want that to break up. Yeah. And yeah, it's going to be expensive. You know, school fees are going to be expensive. Maybe you can take the money or borrow the money from your parents and hopefully pay them back if possible in the future. That's what family is for. That's what parents and, and overall your, your, your extended family is for. You, you're all here to help each other, right? Grow. So that's what needs to happen. The society has to be a strong, cohesive society. The family system has to be robust. We have to maintain it. We have to nourish it. What's happening is the opposite right now, especially with this wokeness that's coming into Indian society these days. So we need a blend of modernity and tradition. Modernity in, in terms of technology and ease of life and, and all that, but we cannot destroy the foundation of our society in the name of modernity. So it's it's definitely a challenge when you have kids when you're when you're very young when you're in your early twenties you most likely won't be able to afford everything you know the, the upkeep the raising of the kids and school fees and all well rely on your parents until you are financially self self sufficient which can most likely happen by the by your mid twenties or late twenties yeah and I'm sure your parents won't begrudge this they'll be happy to to help out most parents are like this some parents obviously may may have other ideas but that's how it goes so i know it's it's a challenge it's tough but we have to do this and in the long run you will realize that if you have kids early it was it was the best thing you, you could have done yeah so yeah that's how it is anisha says can you explain the history of iraq and the syria conflict the iraq conflict and the syria conflict and what's the Solution to the problems of that region. Okay, let's take a look at the map. Where is the map? Let's take a look at Iraq and Syria. We know where India is, subcontinent. Then westwards is Iran. And then you have Iraq and Syria, right? Iraq uh, uh, touches the Persian Gulf. Obviously, you have Kuwait here. And Syria is, uh, it, it, it has uh, the coast 
the Mediterranean coast. Yeah. So what's the history of this place, right? So let's not let's not go back thousands of years. Obviously, you had Mesopotamia, the the, Mesopot- the Mesopotamian civilization in Iraq. Syria also has a very old history. But let's let's talk about the history of the conflict. Yeah. So uh, it all dates back to the end of the First World War. World War One ended in the well. When did it end? Late 1910s. It started in 1914 and ended around 1920. Okay, look up the dates. Look up the dates. So at the end of World War 18, 1918, maybe. So at the end of World War One, uh, the Ottoman Empire had been destroyed. The Western powers destroyed the Ottoman Empire, which was anyway crumbling. It was crumbling since the 19th century. So they destroyed and and dismembered the Ottoman Empire, and they divided it up among themselves. They created, there was this thing called the League of Nations, which is the precursor to today's United Nations. Okay, So the League of Nations, which was entirely controlled by the Western powers, it decided that there should be something called a mandate system. So the Ottoman Empire will be broken up into pieces and each of these will be called a mandate. And one piece will be called the, will be given to the, the British to rule the British mandate of Iraq. It was called Iraq. And one part was given to the French, which became Syria. So I think Iraq was given in 1920, Syria was in 1918, or or vice versa, whatever it is, that, that's not very important. I'm talking about cause and effect. So Syria became a French mandate and Iraq became a British mandate. Why did the British want this big piece of territory for themselves? They wanted this as a vassal state, as a buffer state for two purposes. This region is rich in oil and the British wanted the oil, just like the Americans do today. Why did the Americans go to war with Iraq? <laughs> for oil, not for democracy and freedom. Just see how many people they killed through carpet bombing. So it's all about the oil. So the British wanted control over Iraq to present the Iraq, firstly for the oil, and secondly, because they wanted to safeguard the Suez Canal, which was the umbilical cord of the British Empire at the time. Yeah, At the time, they still controlled India, and they needed safe passage through, through the Suez region, Al-Suez, the Suez Canal. So the proximity to, to this region gave them... Uh, it was it was good for them so that's why they wanted iraq so they took over the mandate of iraq uh, the mandate of iraq in 1920 or so and the french took over syria in uh, 1918 or somewhere around there let's say 1920 roughly yeah uh, then uh, eventually i think by 1928 or 1938 or so they the british so supposedly gave freedom to iraq but they kept on interfering in the internal affairs and they, they kept on controlling the oil production and all that until when uh, 1950s or something. Yeah, I think until 1958. The Suez crisis happened in 1956 and the British were in control of the oil production and various other things in Iraq until 1958. And after that, I think the Americans kind of started putting their fingers in, in, in the pie and the Americans started controlling Iraq. You had all these revolutions and um, coups and all that in Iraq. Eventually, the Ba'ath Party uh, took over. Saddam Hussein took over. Saddam, Saddam Hussein was allied with the U.S. He was a vassal of the Americans, and the Americans were very happy with him. Yeah, for for a significant amount of time. In Syria, what happened is that uh, uh, there were these various. Uh, uh, there was various governments came and, and, and went. I think in 1970 there was a bloodless coup, and uh, Bashar. No, sorry. Hafez al-Assad came to power. He was a military guy. There was a bloodless coup. He came to power. He allied Syria with with the USSR. He allied Syria with the USSR and Syria became active in the regional geopolitics. Uh, So Hafez al-Assad died in 2000. Uh, Even though Syria had aligned with the USSR, they allied with the US in the first Gulf War to to liberate uh, Kuwait from Saddam Hussein. That's interesting. So, senior Assad died in 2000 and his son, the junior Asha, Assad, Hafez Bashar, Bashar al-Assad <laughs> came to power. Yeah, it, it's a dynastic succession. Um, and then in 2011, there was this so-called Arab Spring, which were these color revolutions instigated by the Americans across the Arabian uh, countries. There was one in Egypt and other places as well. Libya was destroyed by the Americans. Uh, Gaddafi was, was assassinated. Uh, and, and various other color revolutions throughout the Arab world. So the Americans tried a similar thing in Syria as well. There was this so-called outpouring of, of uh, protests and unrest uh, against the 
the authoritarian rule supposedly of of Assad that was the Syrian civilian war so Assad the uh, father and the son they are both a part of a minority community in Syria so Syria has this mixture see these are artificial nations as you can see you have straight borders you know straight lines wherever you have straight lines you have artificial borders and wherever artificial borders have been created every nation becomes a, mi a mix of ethnicities which is unnatural and which is something that generates unrest and civil wars and that's why all these regions are so so messed up so in Syria you have Sunni Muslims you have Christians you have Kurds and you have the Alawi people the Alawites the Alawites are have traditionally been oppressed by by the Sunnis. The Alawites are are Shias. They're also influenced historically by Christianity and Zoroastrianism. Mm -hmm. And the Alawis are about ten to twelve percent of the population of of the of, of Syria. The Assads are Alawis. They are Alawites. So they are a minority who rule Syria, and the that's been used to to create unrest in Syria among the Sunni Muslims and other people. So in 2011, the Americans instigated a civil war in Syria, and uh, and uh, significant portions of the country fell to the so-called rebels, including Al Qaeda, who were fighting on behalf of the U.S. and and many other uh, coalitions and forces. Um, in 2015, the Russians under Vladimir Putin intervened in Syria. Yeah. At this time, you had U.S. troops in Syria. The Russians then intervened in Syria. They, you got Russian troops and Russian material and, and aircraft, etc., that uh, came into Syria. There is this port in Syria, Latakia, where you have, uh, where at times the Russian aircraft carrier has been parked and Russian warships have been there. So after 2015, the tide turned because of Russia, thanks to Russia, and the Americans eventually withdrew their forces from from Syria. But then they asked Turkey to get involved. So the Turks have got involved in Syria. They have uh, occupied, I think, the northeastern part of Syria, which is currently under Turkish occupation. And that's the kind of situation you have in Syria right now. Overall, Basad al-Ashar is mostly secure thanks to the support of Russia and Vladimir Putin. And right now the Americans are fighting a proxy war in northern Syria through Turkey, through the Kurds, because the Kurds have always wanted a free, uh, their own homeland in this region. So that's the deal. That's the kind of uh, history Syria has had. That's the history of the Syrian conflict. It's not yet over because uh, it's, uh, you know, to end the conflict, you have to cut off funding and cut off support to what's happening. But uh, that, that's not the case. So Syria is kind of still in, in a state of civil war to a certain extent. But uh, Assad is now more or less in control of most parts of the country. And now it's kind of a civil war, kind of in a very small way, like what's happening in Ukraine through through proxy. Yeah. So the Turks are the American proxy in Syria. And the Turks have these expansionist tendencies. So they're happy to occupy parts of other countries, right? So uh, like the Turks have occupied parts of Cyprus and they are also playing games against Armenia. They keep threatening Greece. So Turkey is happy to, do, to, to play this role. In the case of Iraq, we know what happened to Saddam Hussein, and now Iraq has been totally destroyed. <laughs> and I don't, I don't even know who's in power there. It doesn't really matter. They're all puppets. So that, in in brief, is is the history of Iraq in the Syria conflict. What's the solution? The solution is for the occupying forces, the Western powers, to get out of the region. And then it will take some time, a few decades, maybe a century or two, for the region to realign itself naturally. These processes take time. Once the external influence goes away, the, the colonial imp, uh, imperial influence goes away, then things can realign themselves, readjust themselves on their own, but that takes time. It, it's, it's often messy. So all these problems that have been created across the world by the by the Westerners, all these uh, nations that have straight line borders, which are completely artificial and un un unnatural, these are going to create conflicts in the future. After the Western influence has been taken away, it's going to take a long time for things to go back to their natural order. This is a recipe for civil war and disaster and worse across Africa, across the Middle East, and even in the Indian subcontinent. That's what they've done. They have planted the seeds for maybe a couple of centuries of conflicts. And it's it, their, their intervention is still happening, the Western intervention in all these regions. So it's, it's going to be a long time before things go back to, to the way they should, the natural order of things. The solution is for the West to disengage and withdraw and let these nations and the peoples and the cultures, you know, figure it out among themselves through whatever means is necessary. To, to to 
you know the the future that they want and that's going to first go through a phase of conflict multi multiple conflicts possibly that's how it is that's that's the dirty game they played sobir kaze says what are your views on indians considering the us as the biggest threat, threat after china and how has the U- russia ukraine war changed the perspective of indians because many indians learned geopolitics after the invasion and got to know how geopolitics works i think indians are still figuring out, figuring out how geopolitics works but indians are no longer that naive nowadays which is visible from the fact that they now indian most of the respondents considered the us as the second largest military threat to india after china if you had asked indians in 19 uh, in in 2017 they would have said pakistan is the number one threat most indians until 19 uh, until 2017 viewed pakistan as the number one threat to india then you had the doklam doklam crisis then you had the galwan clash then china came into focus then all the news media started focusing on china and then china came into the national consciousness and now indians understand that china is the primary threat pakistan is just a proxy of other other forces so pakistan exists as long as it serves certain purposes and it is propped up right now by the west per previous state was china now indians i think are beginning to realize this especially people who watch this channel understand this <laughs> uh, and the russia ukraine war has certainly changed the perspective of indians to some extent if you watch the indian news media even today you watch any hindi news channel or most english news channels they report as if it's it's they are reporting on behalf of the west it's it's they're purely aping and copying the western top, talking points most of the reporting in india is still extremely silly like they have no opinion of their own they just watch what's being said on on the british news or the or the american news and then they say the same things in hindi or in in some other way in english that's typically what what it been there are a couple of major indian english language news channels that sent their reporters to the ukraine conflict region and they reported everything from the Ukrainian side of the conflict. If you want to have balanced reporting, send a couple of people also on the Russian side of the conflict and report from both sides. Then we know what's happening. No, they won't do it that way. And they call it great reporting. So the Indian media is 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 like um, I I don't have any anything much nice to say about them. Yeah, but yes, Indians are now slowly realizing uh, about geopolitics. Possibly because of the role that Dr. Jayashankar is playing in the entire thing. He's probably one of the um, most active and most impactful diplomats in the world right now. He is putting forth India's uh, perspective uh, firmly without without, uh, uh, devolving into what we call the wolf warrior diplomacy that the Chinese are involving, indulge in, which is rather uh, nasty and and it's unpleasant. Dr. Jayashankar is is none of that. He's a very... uh, very firm diplomat, but he is, is very eloquent and he, he is very persuasive. Obviously, the West is not going to be persuaded, but at least it's educating Indians as to what India's national interest is and where India's interests lie from the geopolitical perspective on the big global scale. So I think um, Dr. Jayashankar has played a, a major role in educating Indians. Yeah, uh, I think uh, he has acquired a significant fan following and that's I mean, he should have more fans, actually, considering the incredible role that he's playing. So, yeah, I think uh, it is much of it is thanks to Dr. Jayashankar. And because of the, see, the, what we call the Jayashankar doctrine, eventually, after all, is the Modi doctrine. Dr. Jayashankar is carrying out the policies that Mr. Modi wants him to carry out. From 2014 to 2019, it was Mr. Modi who was a de facto foreign minister of India. Mr. Modi was the de facto foreign minister of India. Most of it was being done by him, despite us having an actual uh, nominal foreign minister. No disrespect to anyone involved. I'm just saying that if you look at facts, Mr. Modi was doing the bulk of the work of the foreign ministry. And Mr. Modi was doing it extremely effective, effectively. But now th- um, he has been able to uh, delegate this work to an extremely capable person. And that's great for us. So th- that tells you the value of having a professional as a foreign minister, as opposed to a politician who takes up the job because they they want power or status or whatever, I'm, I'm not I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, by the way. Okay, so uh, 
So things have changed a lot after the Ukraine conflict happened. We, we, in India, we have started looking elsewhere. We always looked at Pakistan then in the last two, three years at China. But now we are looking elsewhere as well. And we are beginning to understand Indians, the Indian young people especially, are beginning to understand how the game is played. It's all about power. It's all about resources. It's all about control. When now we are beginning to understand what role the economy plays, what role the military plays, all that. It's it's great to see this. We are, Most Indians are still learning. But at least we are seeing them waking up now. And the results of this poll that you're mentioning is, is kind of an indicator that Indians have kind of woken up now. And Indians are not that naive anymore. A year ago, I used to get really frustrated how naive Indians are. Yeah, that's not the, it's not quite the case today. People have really woken up. So I'm, I'm really, really happy to see that. Rodrajit Rod, says, uh, Iran doesn't have very good relations with Turkey and Pakistan. Why doesn't Iran support the Kurdish independence movement or the Balochistan independence movement? All right, let's take a look at the map. Everything becomes clear when you look at the map. This is, if, if you learn nothing from this channel, you please learn this. You want to understand a nation's foreign policy? Look at the map. The map will tell you what the foreign policy should be. <laughs> so let's take a look at the map. Right. We are talking about Iran and we're talking about uh, the Kurdish movement and the Balochistan independence movement. Yes. So uh, where is Balochistan? Where is Kurdistan? I think that's what we have to ask ourselves. Let's uh, close that for a second and let's let's see Balochistan. Balochistan. Let's do a Google search for that. <laughs> Kurdistan. And let's put that on the screen so that uh, you get uh, you get the context. <sighs> All right, let's put this on the screen. Kurdistan. Let's go to the map of what Kurdistan is. This is what Kurdistan, Kurdistan ought to be. The uh, light-colored region that you see in the screen. Let me bigify this. Okay, this is a bigger... <laughs> Okay, there we go. So the Kurdish inhabited Kurdish majority region is the light colored region. As you can see, it encompasses parts of Iran, large regions of Anatolia, present day Turkey, temporarily, maybe not, uh, parts of Syria and parts of Iraq. So the Kurdish people don't have a nation of their own. They are divided into four or five countries. Their, their, their territory is divided, has been taken over by four or five countries, Turkey, Iran, Iraq and Syria. And some of it is even in, in, in Azerbaijan, Armenia, maybe. Yeah. So that's the deal. So why would Iran support Kurdish independence if it would mean that the Iranians would have to give up some territory for this independent nation? Why would they do that? The Kurds, the Kurdish people are not an Arabic people. They are an Indo-Iranian people or, or the West, Western historians would call them an Iraq, Iranic people. And Iranian people. Um, they used to be historically Zoroastrians or something else, perhaps, maybe something even before Zoroastrianism. But today they are Muslims, but they are not Arabs. So they are very they have very close cultural and ethnic ties with the people of Iran, the Persian people. And yet Iran occupies about maybe a quarter of their territory. So if Iran were to support support Kurdish independence, it would mean that Iran would be willing to give up this. Kurdish portion of its territory. And that is something no nation will ever, ever do. So that's why Iran doesn't support Kurdish independence. Now let's talk about Balochistan. Let's talk about Balochistan. Once again, we go to images and let's see the map of Balochistan. Let us bigify this. This is the bigified map. Embigand. This is the embigand map. So this is the ethnic the a map of ethnic groups in western india and now temporarily whatever nations there are yeah so the dark brown thing is punjab which was historically the territory of maharaja ranjit singh which the british have given up given to pakistan illegally yeah this brown territory has always been was the sikh empire i don't understand why it was given to to punjab actually i do understand why but it was not right sindh is yellow Green is the Pashtun dominated, dominated region and pink is Balochistan. Do you see where Balochistan is? It is it is in Pakistan, parts of Afghanistan and a significant portion of it is occupied by Iran. You could say that at least a third of Balochistan 
about a third of Balochistan is currently occupied by Iran. Yeah, you go to Chabahar, you go to this region, you will see Balochi people there who have right now Iranian citizenship. So if Iran were to support the independence of Balochistan, they would have to give up this pink portion of their territory as well. So why would they do it? And this is one of the reasons why India is right now not playing to, to is not playing this Balochistan independence card too strongly. Because if India were to support independence of Balochistan, it, it means that we would have to also support the secession of the Iran Iranian portion of Balochistan. Yeah, I mean, uh, morally we would, we would we would have to do that or or whatever. So that's why that's one of the reasons why India is not going down that road right now. Because we uh, we have good relations with Iran and we we need uh, we have uh, a certain convergence of geopolitical interests with Iran. So let's not go down, down the road. So Iran doesn't have good relations with Turkey or Pakistan, but they will not support independence for the Kurds and they will not support independence for Balochistan because they hold, they, they, they have taken over territories of both these peoples. And why should they give it up? No nation ever does that. So that is the reason why Iran will not support the Kurdish independence movement or the Balochistan independence movement. There is good reason for them not to do that. Interesting. Of course, it's interesting. Next question. Daniel Nicholson says, when India and China eventually and inevitably rise as the numero uno, numero uno civilizations, how would Europe compete to remain affluent as they are today? Firstly, okay, good question. Firstly, it's going to be either India or China, eventually. It's not going to be both. It's not going to be both. There's, there's only room for one top dog <laughs> in the world. At any given point in time, sometimes you have this uh, this uh, bipolar situation, but it's typically nations that are situated geographically far apart. Two nations that are like today, India and China are, are essentially neighbors temporarily because the Chinese have have occupied Tibet. Yeah, so that's that is going to come to a head eventually. Eventually, it's going to be either India or China. Okay, now the question is what what will happen to Europe? How will Europe compete? Ask yourselves this one question. Forget about Russia. Russia is not part of Europe. Russia is an, is an East, Eastern culture. Okay. Let's talk about Western Europe. Uh, what's, what's part of NATO? Uh, NATO and the EU. That is the Europe we are talking about. Ask yourselves this very simple question. What do these nations produce? What natural resources do these nations have? Do they have large quantities of oil? Do they have large quantities of gas? Do they have large quantities of iron or copper or any minerals or coal or, or any such thing? Do they produce large quantities of, of food grains? These nations overall, if you put them together, they have next to nothing in terms of natural resources or any such thing. The reason why they are so incredibly affluent is because of the past five centuries of colonization and loot and plunder of mainly India and also Africa and other nations. And of course, of course, the Americas. Yeah. So the reason why these nations are so affluent is because of theft and plunder and genocide and colonization. And of course, they use the money to build themselves, themselves up and create all these systems. And obviously, they have done a good job of, of using the money to, to create this extremely advanced society, these extremely advanced societies. Yeah. So one has to give it to them that once they stole the money, they were they were able to put it to good use. But eventually, when either India or China rise and they become the preeminent civilization, and they establish a different kind of world order as opposed to the to the, to the US rules-based world order, which is a neo-colonial world order, neo-imperial world order. Once India or China imposes their world order on the world, which will happen within 50 years or 100 years, most likely, then these guys will have no other source of income. Even today, Africa is being plundered as if it was still colonized. You don't realize this, yeah, because it's, it's done in a very nice way by the... the <laughs> by proxy i mean eastern Af uh, western africa mali etc has some of the world's largest gold reserves but these countries are dirt poor while most of their gold is in france how does that happen it's called neo colonization so once this system of theft and plunder and neo imperialism and neo colonization is ended europe will inevitably decline and go back to where they have always belonged you know Europe has historically never been the most prosperous region. 
they went through the rise of europe only happened in the past 500 or so years before that europe was never prosperous look at the gdp charts of the past 2000 years angus madison look it up yeah i'm not going to put it in the screen you can uh, do that much homework yourself look up the gdp charts and see in the past 2000 years which european nation had anything like the gdp of 1/10th of india or 1/10th of china none of the european nations had it if you put the whole of africa together it did not add up to india's gdp and so on so eventually as either india or china rises to the top europe is going to decline and it since it doesn't really produce anything intrinsically it's going to go into poverty eventually and especially when they will have no other place to plunder that's how it's going to go and yeah the world is going to change a lot and we are wit- beginning witnessing the beginnings of that we are witnessing the beginnings of that we are in a way living through a very dangerous and difficult time very turbulent time but on the other hand we are also very priv- privileged to witness these changes happening in real time typically such changes happen over decades or centuries we are witnessing this happen week upon week month upon month year upon year by the time the 2020s end the world is going to be a very different place take it from me right okay two questions about uh, a similar topic grave walker says your opinion on the recent find of indian dna in greece from 1500 bce and the decipherment of linear a script using linear b script reveals sanskrit oh my god what is this did mitanni groups go further from syria or is it something else descended from rigvedic clans asks very good questions a paper was dropped on 17 january with 106 samples on ancient greek ancestry and 66 samples are from the island of crete um uh, where bharatiya langurs are offering saffron to a goddess as depicted in the ancient minoan period 1600 bce these samples have 13 to 10% bharatiya ancestry we have the examples of zebu cattle uh, griffins uh, indus valley griffins shield lapis lazuli ring found on the minoan sites saraswati sindhu civilization and minoan culture have similarities in hydro technologies according to a 2020 paper what's my thoughts about these evidences all right good question so i have recently come across this paper i haven't studied it in detail but let's first take a look at what this region is where, where where is this region the island of crete in the minoan region where is it so we know where india is yes all right let's orient ourselves let's go slowly westward so that we can keep up go west we have iran go west we have iraq syria then we enter the mediterranean sea region we have anatolia which is currently called turkey mostly and then you have the island of crete crete it's historically been a greek island you had the great minoan civilization in this region yeah the minoan civilization go- dates back to about uh, 3500 BCE that's the beginnings of the minoan civilization so the minoan civilization was uh, around these islands in the aegean sea crete and the aegean sea islands it was a seafaring uh, island based civilization it was a you could say you could say it's a, it was a kind of greek sort of civilization or a pre greek civilization right so uh, which now so now that we have oriented ourselves let's take a look at the paper that we are referring to where is the paper ancient dna reveals something admixture of things here it is here we go let's a uh, hide this for a second ancient dna reveals admixture history and endogamy in the prehistoric aegean sea region and uh, it's a 102 ancient individuals from crete the greek mainland and the aegean islands spanning from the neolithic to the iron age and all that and there's a detailed description of the findings and uh, you can find this is the region that they're talking about the points are the places where from where they found the uh, samples and all that so we will not go into the details of the paper but it becomes clear that about 10 to 13% or whatever of these samples have indian ancestry they call it andamanese dna or whatever but it's indian ancestry you know they they use terms that are extremely misleading and confusing for most people so the thing is that this this is indian dna and, and let's let's talk about the monkeys right the langurs uh let us talk about the langurs found on santorini island uh one second let's put that on the screen here we are santorini santo rini langurs so there are these paintings ancient paintings on santorini island 
they depict very strange monkeys that are not found in the region the monkeys uh, monkeys are depicted as bluish in in nature their faces have a different color darker faces and they have these incredibly curved tails yeah and eventually the scientists realized the researchers realized that these are indian langurs hanuman langurs yeah here is another fresco uh, there are more murals of these monkeys yeah and these monkeys are found in india not in the mediterranean region not in the aegean region so uh, that's the that's the surprising founding that what that people uh, realized recently so this is an article from 2020 it's from a uh, physics portal solving the greek monkey mystery gave us an important clue to the bronze age world uh, they talk about the akrotiri excavations the blue monkeys and all that and they eventually realized that these were indian hanuman monkeys they thought it was baboons or vervets or grivet monkeys african species and all that uh, but then they found the tails and all that and where is it hanuman langurs eventually they re- realized these are hanuman langurs right so how did indian monkeys end up all the way in santorini and the aegean sea is the question so first of all that indicates that uh, this 3600 year old city had ties with ancient india at that time we had the saraswati sindhu or so called indus valley civilization period of indian history right uh, so that's a deal and now we have this paper that talks about uh, the fact that a certain percentage of these these samples uh, 13% or so have indian ancestry indian ancestry so not only indian monkeys but indian genetics are found in this region and this dates to to about 1700 bc to about about 1000 bc yeah these samples the, the date range of the samples is from about 1700 to about 1000 bc in the aegean sea region of present day greece now we know that in this region we had the minoan civilization the minoan civilization dates back to about 3500 bc it lasted till about 1000 bc so this is definitely smack bang in this uh, time time period so either the minoans themselves had indian ancestry or you or you could look at uh, neighboring kingdoms and empires we had the mitannis and the hittites so so the the agency region is here and close to it we had the the mitanni that we have spoken about multiple times who clearly were of indian origin the mitanni uh kingdom in in syria and anatolia yeah this region here if you can see my mouse pointer we also had the hittites who were most likely of indian origin uh they lived in anatolia west of the mitannis yes and uh, the mitannis date back to about about 1800 bc starting point and the hittites date back to about 1700 bc starting point syria and anatolia uh, most likely the mitanni and the hittites had indian uh, it is almost certain that they had indian ancestry the mitannis uh, were an indo aryan so, so to say aristocracy that ro- ruled over the local horian population so that's quite close to the uh, agency region and it's possible that uh, the indian ancestry came in from either the mitannis or the hittites it's also possible that it came it originated with the minoans themselves dating back to 4000 to to almost 3500 bc now then there is this other thing this uh, new paper that's been published uh, that is what is being referred to by grave walker yeah decipherment of linear a using linear b script so in in the aegean sea region uh, in the minoan culture there have been, they have found two scripts one is linear a and one is linear b linear b clearly is an ancient form of greek okay but linear a has never been kind of deciphered until you come to this paper this article from 2022 and now it appears that you have sanskrit words that are being attested that, that are being attested in this script so it looks like linear a was used to write either sanskrit or a closely related descendant language an indo aryan language so they have found a uh, indo evidence of indo aryan dialect in 10 minoan linear a inscriptions so let's take a look at the inscriptions uh, they 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 have all these so there are words like uh, thalassa this is the greek uh, script but it says thalassa labyrinth 
Thos, and so on. So uh, these Greek words apparently have a Sanskrit etymology or origin. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this paper talks about that. So this paper has, uh, so you can read the paper and it looks like linear A was used to write either Sanskrit or an Indo-Aryan language. So once again, this points to an out of India migration in deep antiquity. We know what happened 4,200 years ago, which is uh, the 4.2 kilo year event, the, the century of drought across most of the world, which kind of ended the, the which uh, dried up the Saraswati River and made people disperse from the Saraswati Sindhu region in westwards as well as eastwards. Yeah. And which coincides with the appearance of Indian Zebu cattle in, in the so called Fertile Crescent region, which again is adjoining this Asian Sea region. So these are all coincidences that add up together. So most likely it is either the Mitannis or the Hittites or maybe the Minoans themselves who had Indian ancestry. And now it, with, when you take the evidence of the decipherment of the linear A script, which seems to be either Sanskrit or a very closely related language, then it is possible that the Minoans themselves were of Indian ancestry. At least the ancestors. And then they may have inter intermixed with the local populations as well. But the overall culture remained the original culture, which eventually morphed into what is now Greek culture or, or pre-Greek culture or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's the kind of uh, evidence we are finding. As these pieces of evidence add up, it points more and more in one direction that there were multiple out of India migrations as opposed to an into India Aryan invasion, migration, picnic, tourism, whatever. It was out of India. Out of India, a uh, flow of genetics and culture and languages. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's a very interesting uh, new development. And I still have to read the entire paper in detail, but very interesting. So that's the, that's the preliminary uh, impressions and thoughts that I can offer to you. Tejas says, why did the Arabs and Turks and Mughals not dissolve into Indian culture like the Kushans and the Shakas and the Greeks did? <laughs> good, 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 good question. We just spoke about the fact that the Greeks may have Indian ancestry, right? And if you look at ancient Greek culture, it was a polytheistic culture. The Greek pantheon of gods is a copy of the Vedic pantheon of gods. Their greatest god, Jupiter, uh, sorry, Zeus Pater, is nothing but Dios Pitru of the, which is the old Greek Vedic god. But uh, Zeus Pater also has elements of Indra, the thunderbolt, the Vajra. Right, the hammer. The hammer is kind of latent in this, but yeah. So Greek culture, if you go back to the origins, it kind of originates in Indian culture. So when the Greeks, uh, uh, after the failed disaster of Alexander's in invasion of India, attempted invasion of India, then you had the Seleucid Mauryan War, which was kind of a handshake kind of thing. Hi, get, nice to know you. And then the Mauryan Emperor, Empire and the Seleucid Empire became allies, very strong allies with family relations, yeah, intermarriage and all that. And then after the dissolve, dissolution of the Seleucid Empire in the northwest of India, let's put the map on the screen because that, that's what helps us understand things. Where's the map? Back to the map. So then you had these Indo-Greek kingdoms in Gandhar, in northwestern India, present day Afghanistan and uh, western Pakistan, northern Pakistan, all that, yeah, present day. And these Greeks, these, these uh, rulers of, of these regions were originally of Greek ancestry. And then they intermingled with the local people, the local Indians, and they became very much Indian. Yeah. And they anyway were polytheists and their culture, even if you go back in time, originated in India itself, most likely. So it was not hard for them to harmoniously integrate themselves into Indian society. And people, if they ask, where are the Greeks today? Well, they are all among us. <laughs> Most people in these regions, northern and western India, would have fractional Greek ancestry, maybe half a percent, maybe one percent. Yeah. And it's it won't be visible at all. And the Greeks are anyway not very different, not very European as such. Yeah. So that's about the Greeks. The Kushans, they originated in Uttarakuru. The kingdoms of Uttarakuru were Indianized kingdoms. They were of Indian origin themselves. We know that. 
Um, and the Scythians, the Shakas, they originated from Uttara Madhra, which is present-day Central Asia. These were all Indianized regions, and the original inhabitants were of all they're all of Indian origin. Of course, they, they these were nomads, especially the, the Shakas, the Scythians, they were nomads and they, they roamed as far as Eastern Europe. They conquered parts of Eastern Europe and much of these regions, the entire Central Asian steppe, and they intermingled and um, and, and mixed up with people of Europe as well. Uh, so that's what happened. But overall, the Scythians were sun worshippers. And when they re-entered India, they also were able to integrate very harmoniously with Indian society without any friction that is known of at all. I mean, there is no historical record of any uh, ethnic friction or strife or any such thing. They just assimilated harmoniously into Indian society. And they were great rulers uh, for, for the time that they ruled India. The uh, northern Chhatrapas and the western Chhatrapas, right? The western Chhatrapas were the great uh, lords and protectors of the great uh, Jyotirling of Somnath and so on. So the Scythians were also of Indian origin and they were also polytheists. And same goes for the Kushans. Yeah. When it comes to the Arabs and Turks, the Mughals are Turks themselves. They came from a very different... See, initially there were these, these Huns who invaded India, which are the originators of the, what, of the later Turks. The Huns, eventually, some of them became Turks. They later became known as Turks. So we had the Turk Shahi dynasties in India, in, in mainly... Gandhar, Afghanistan, that actually defended India for a couple of centuries against the Turkic invasions, the initial Turkic invasions. Yeah. So even the Huns were able to assimilate very harmoniously into Indian society, despite being a very different ethnicity. Yeah. The, a Mongolic ethnicity, essentially. Uh, the Turks and the Arabs, the Turks were essentially the descendants of Huns, but they were Islamized. So they were monotheists. They were, uh, they, they practiced Abrahamic uh, culture, so did the Arabs, and that is very different from any polytheistic culture, and that is something that can not integrate itself easily into a polytheistic culture. So that's what happened. It's because of this very stark difference in the culture of the Arabs and the Turks that they were not able to integrate themselves into Indian society the way all other um, visitors were able to. Yeah. So that's the answer, sir, in short. Shaheen says, do you agree that the Japanese goddess Benzaitin and the Persian goddess, Persian goddess Anahita are just other different versions of Saraswati because they are very similar to Saraswati? Anahita was called Aridvi Sura Anahita. And Benzaitin, uh, okay, let's, let's uh, put some of that on the screen. Yeah, I have some stuff here. Let's put that on the screen. So let's talk about Anahita first. The origins of the Persian goddess Anahita. The original name was Aredvi Sura Anahita, which is essentially a, a way of saying Saraswati. Anahita is a river goddess. Yeah. Um, so, the, oh yeah, it says here Aredvi Sura Anahita, a Western name of an Indo Iranian cosmological figure. Uh, go goddess of the waters, fertility, wisdom, healing. In this uh, depiction, she is on a lion, I think, and she has a sun behind her or, or a halo. This is a Persian or Greek kind of depiction of Anahita. Aphrodite, in the guise of Aphrodite, so the, the Greeks uh, borrowed this. <laughs> uh, conflation with Ishtar, which is a Semitic uh, divinity and all that. But this is nothing but the Persian version of Saraswati because the divinity is unattested in any old western Iranian language establishing characteristics prior to the introduction of Zoroastrianism in western Iran is very much in the realm of speculation uh, the Achaemenids devotion to the goddess even evidently survived their conversion to Zoroastrianism which means that this is a pre-Zoroastrian goddess the Achaemenid dynasty converted to Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism from which religion? From Hinduism, obviously. The original Persians were Hindus. Zarathustra himself was born a Hindu. Right? So it's it's clear that this is uh, Saraswati, the, the Persian version, the Persian form of Saraswati. Now let's talk about Benzaitin, shall we? So this is from Encyclopedia Britannica, Benzaitin, or Benten, they call it. Uh, so this is one of the f seven gods of luck or uh, divinities of luck in Japanese culture. Um, the Buddhist patron goddess of literature and music and wealth and femininity, which is nothing but Saraswati. Uh, all that. 
she is identified with the Indian goddess Saraswati, also a patron of literature and the arts, who probably traveled to Japan along with Buddhism. So Buddhism brought with it Hindu gods and goddesses into Japan. And uh, there are seven gods, major gods in Japan. So Bishamon, let's take a look at Bishamon. Bishamon or Bishamonten is essentially Kuber, the Buddhist uh, version of Kuber or Veshravana. All right. Let's see who all, who else we have. Uh, Daikoku. Daikoku is Mahakala, the Hindu god Shiva, in his aspect as time, the great destroyer, and so on and so forth. So it's clear that Benzaiten is Saraswati. Let's take a look at what Benzaiten is depicted as representations, artistic Benzaiten. Okay, let's see how the Japanese depict Benzaiten. So she is uh, depicted as a goddess who plays a string instrument like, like the Veena, for instance, we have. And she's on a dragon here. Here again, she's playing a, wind, uh, a string instrument. Here, uh, sometimes she's on a dragon, sometimes some other beast, sometimes on a lotus. Over here, she's on, on, a, on, a, on a swan like uh, in India. Let's see this. Over here, she's on a white lotus like the way she's depicted in India. So yes, Benzaiten is clearly the Japanese version of Saraswati and she is even in Japan the goddess of knowledge and wisdom and, and literature and femininity and, and water she is strongly associated with water and the sea, sometimes she is shown as being on a fish, sometimes some other animal here it's a dragon and, and so on Yeah, and she always has a string instrument with her, so it's clear that Anahita is, is the Persian Saraswati and Benzaiten is the Japanese Saraswati do you know the distance between Persia and Japan all of that was Indianized at one point in time. And yeah, that's the history. Right. What else shall we talk about? Rodrajit says, our history textbooks say that before the European colonization of Africa, there was nothing but jungle and dangerous wild animals and primitive, backward, uncivilized people in Africa. Is this another propaganda to make the Europeans look superior? No, it's propaganda designed to hide the fact that Europe destroyed Africa. Africa was an extremely developed place. It had its own beautiful cultures. It had kingdoms and empires and civilizations. Yeah, take a look at Africa, how large it is. And Europe reduced this to complete abject misery and poverty. And to hide that, they have depicted Africa like this. So let's talk about some of the African kingdoms. We know about Egypt. Egypt is, well, over here. And India had ancient ties with Egypt. We know that. So Egypt... Uh, Everybody knows about that. We also know about, some of us may know about Carthage, which was in North Africa, Tunisia, yeah, the empire of Carthage from the 9th century BC to about the 2nd century BC, which was eventually destroyed by the Romans, again Europeans. Then you had the kingdom of Aksum in Ethiopia, Eritrea, that region from the 1st century BC to the 8th century BC or thereabouts, a wonderful a very advanced kingdom with a beautiful culture. You had a, in Sudan, if you go to Sudan, you had the kingdom of Kush from, I don't know, 8th, 9th century BC to about the 4th century AD. You had uh, the Ghana Empire in Western Africa, in, in Mauritania and Mali. Very rich, very prosperous empire from the 5th century AD to about the, I don't know, 12th, 13th, 14th century AD. You had the Mali Empire also. Uh, we know about Mansa Musa and all that. Yeah, We had a kingdom of the great Zimbabwe in Southern Africa which had uh, monumental architecture and, and palaces and fortresses and all that. We had the kingdom of Benin, which was destroyed, which, which was from the 13th century until, until 1897, when it was destroyed, burned to the ground by British troops. So Africa had wonderful history, a very ancient and rich history and beautiful cultures. The Africans are not one single people. There are so many different ethnicities and, and cultures within Africa. And today it's like, you know, Africa, the Africans are just one people. And there was nothing in Africa except uh, jungles and poverty and savagery. That's not the case. It is Europe that has totally destroyed Africa. Totally destroyed Africa. So yeah, that's the thing about Africa. Whatever propaganda has been put in place has been put in place by the Europeans to kind of hide what they have done to Africa. Okay, next question. 
Debashis Goswami says, what's the difference between happiness, joy, and bliss? <laughs> We're talking philosophy here. Philosophy. So listen, I don't... Uh, who am I to teach you what is joy, happiness, and peace? Let us go to our ancient scriptures. Shall we? Let us go to the Taittiriya Upanishad. And let's talk about bliss and joy and happiness. So the Taittiriya Upanishad. First, let's put that on the screen. Taittiriya Upanishad. Is it on the screen? Taittiriya Upanishad. So what is the Taittiriya Upanishad? It is part of the Krishna Yajurveda, the black, the dark Yajurveda. So uh, the Taittiriya Upanishad has three chapters. The Sikshavalli, the Anandavalli and the Brigavalli. So these are available in Sanskrit. They are available in Tamil. They are available in Telugu. They are also available in the uh, Roman script, in English. Yeah. So let's talk about the Anandavalli, which is the second chapter of the Taittiriya Upanishad. And let's go to a translation. Now, these translations are not uh, necessarily very accurate, but I'm just putting on the, on the screen so that we get an idea of what, what it talks about. So it's a, it's a, we're going to talk about this particular Anuvag 8 of the Anandavalli. Okay. Uh, so it says, suppose a youth, a young person, a good youth, learned in the sacred lore, promptest in action, steadiest in heart, strongest in body. Suppose he owns the entirety of the earth with all of its wealth. That is one human bliss. What is a hundred times the human bliss? That is one bliss of the Gandharvas, the human Gandharvas. What is a hundred times the bliss of human Gandharvas? That is one bliss of the Deva Gandharvas. What is a hundred times the bliss of the Deva Gandharvas is one bliss of the Pitrus. The Pitrus. Uh, what is a hundred times the bliss of the Pitrus uh, is one bliss of the Devas born in Ajana, Karma Devas. And a hundred times the, the bliss of the also of the these Devas is one bliss of the Karma Devas who have reached Devalok by work. Then 100 times that is uh, the bliss of the Karma Devas is one bliss of the Devas, of the Deva Lok. There are 33 Devas, 8 Vayus, 11 Rudras, 12 Adityas, Indra and Prajapati. These are the main Devas. 100 times the bliss of the main Devas is one bliss of Indra, who is the lord of all the Devas, the king of the Devas. 100 times the bliss of Indra is one bliss of Brihaspati, the teacher of Indra. A hundred times the bliss of Brihaspati is one bliss of Prajapati, the lord of all the creatures. And a hundred times the bliss of Prajapati is one bliss of Brahma, Lord Brahma. And Brahma embodies the entire bliss of the universe. So our bliss is part of the bliss, the, the collective universal bliss of Brahma. So that is something you get to, uh, that, that the Anandavalli chapter of the Tetri Upanishad which is part of the Krishna Yajurveda tells us. So our ancestors, our ancients had really thought about these things in extremely uh, great depth and detail. So that's what I can offer you about happiness, joy, bliss, all that. Yeah. So yeah, that's about that. Okay, we are almost at the end of uh, today's session. Let's take a couple more questions. I have so many more questions. I'm going to have to not take them all. Uh, let's take one, two more, and then I'll take some from the live chat. Mohammed Yaqub Khan says, In Taiwan, many Pakistanis have opened restaurants in the name of India. <laughs> Indian restaurants, yeah. And we have to point out many times to our Indian embassy, but still, uh, they are not. we are not finding a permanent solution. <laughs> Listen, in India, there's nothing you can do about this. If Pakistanis open Indian restaurants, well, their cuisine is also Indian cuisine. And they're going to try and encash on the name of India to get customers. And they'll say, yes, we are Indians. Or, Whatever. The thing is this. In India, in every small town, big city, you have tens of thousands of Chinese restaurants run by Indians. So do we want the, Ch <laughs> the Chinese to protest? So these things, there's nothing you can do about it. Even if we protest to the Indian embassy, the Indian embassy is not in a position to force the Pakistanis to say these are not Indian restaurants, they are Pakistani restaurants. Because there is no such thing as Pakistani cuisine. <laughs> Even Pakistani cuisine is Indian cuisine. Even Bangladeshi cuisine is Indian cuisine. Yeah, they, they, that's what it is. That's what it is. 
so yeah in a way we should well if you want to you can take it as as a compliment that everybody wants to be indian yeah uh, one hears that when pakistanis travel out of india they pretend to be indians so that people are not scared of them yeah so yeah that that's the that's a thing or india Daniel Nicholson says, is it possible to actually develop cruise missiles with literal sea skimming capabilities as shown in sci-fi movies like Stealth, where the UCAV displayed such capabilities? If so, how would such missiles maneuver amongst ground structures? So it is certainly possible to develop such uh, missiles. You, you could have subsonic missiles, supersonic missiles, which is up to 6,000 kilometers per hour, or hypersonics, which are from 6 to 12,000 kilometers per hour, High hypersonics are up to 30,000 kilometers per hour. And then you have re-entry speeds which are higher than 30,000 kilometers per hour. So let's say you want to develop a hypersonic missile uh, which is based on ram scramjet technology. It is possible to, uh, to give it sea skimming abilities. When it's on over sea, it can like be about 10 meters or maybe five meters above the surface, as long as the waves are not too high, it will do fine. But when it, uh, so let's <laughs> let's let's take a hypothetical scenario and don't get angry, okay? I'm just it, it's just a hypothetical scenario. Uh, let's go to the <laughs> map. Let's take this completely hypothetical scenario. Let, let nobody get offended that you have a submarine in, let's say, the Indian Ocean. And it has a hypersonic missile with sea skimming ability, capabilities. And you want to make this uh, missile pay a visit to London, let's say. Okay, this is just a game. This is entirely hypothetical, nothing, uh, no hard feelings here. But let's say we want our missile to pay, pay a visit to London. So you would launch the missile, let's say, from, from the submarine. And it will go over the sea. And you want it to fly, let's say, 10, 5 meters above the sea. Or let's say 10 meters so that it doesn't hit any ship. And uh, you can uh, make the, the missile talk to your satellites or overhead so that you know where the ships are and all that. Uh, and mostly nobody has any radar over the, over the ocean. So it's fine. Nobody will be able to detect it, especially when it's traveling at hypersonic velocities. Then maybe you want it to travel over land where there are very few habitations. So, you know, in desert areas and all that. <laughs> Maybe Somalia, the Horn of Africa, Djibouti, Eritrea, all desert. Uh, Sudan, Egypt, Libya, mostly desert. And you can plot the exact coordinates of the exact precise path you wanted to travel in, in the missiles computer system, in the, in the microchip and all that. So it can take a past path of least resistance. And then it can very quickly cross France or whatever, go over the sea, and then reach London over sea and so on. So you can certainly program this if you if you are able to give the missile a sufficient maneuverable man, maneuvering capabilities and you have such technology which already exists so i am not sure if any missile has been announced that is a hypersonic missile and it also has sea skimming capabilities but it's certainly within the realm of possibility given the present technology that's already available among the major nations of the world uh, when it comes to ground structures, you would want the missile to stay a little higher. So you can program the exact coordinates of the path you wanted to travel based on where you know there are not too many ground structures, mainly, ma mainly over deserts and forests and all that. You can make it travel, uh, fly it maybe 10 meters, maybe 10, 20 meters maximum so that nobody can detect it on radar from far, that sort of thing. So it's certainly possible. All right, I think we will... Uh, I will not be able to take all the other questions I have selected. Let's now take some questions from the live chat. My dear friends, if you have questions you would like me to ask right now on the live chat, go for it. And I will take some question, questions from the live chat. Samarth says, why are people generally attracted towards white skin tone? Historically, Indians had, did not have any such thing. It's only in the past, in, in the past millennium when we were, you know, occupied by, by foreigners, the, the, this sort of attitude seems to have come in. Look at the ancient uh, paintings in Ajanta, Elora, etc. You see people, very attractive, good-looking people who have reasonably dark skin tone. Yeah. Um, think about Lord Krishna, who's supposed to be one of the most good-looking men ever. He, his name is Krishna. He had dark skins, very dark skin. Yeah. Think about someone like Draupadi. 
a very attractive lady from the past. She also is known to have had dark skin. So it's not like it's always been like that. This is these are attitudes that have crept into Indian society along with other defects in the past 1000 years. When a society is under foreign occupation, it is unable, it is prevented from functioning the way it naturally functions. And, and it's under a lot of stress, external stress. And that's why all these defects creep into society. And that's one of the things is this supposed attraction towards white skin tone. All right, let's see something else. Do we have another other questions? Giuseppe Padifraia says, uh, what characteristics should I look for in a potential future wife? I want to get married, but I'm not sure what char characteristics and qualities to look for in a wife. Well, you should look for somebody who is going to be your friend in the long run. Yeah. Obviously, you want someone who is good looking, attractive, uh, uh, maybe good family and uh, all that. Yeah. But marriage is a long term thing. Hopefully, it's a lifelong thing. So you want to be with somebody who is going to be a friend for you in the long run and somebody who's going to be able to support you and 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 uh, encourage you and all that through thick and thin so that's what you need to learn you need to look for today everybody is like especially the the younger generations it's like let's try a few relationships and see how it goes and i'm sure i can do better and i want to find my dream soulmate or something there is no such thing as a dream soulmate or any such thing find somebody with whom you can spend the rest of your life it doesn't have to be what's what what, what the movies show as some kind of starstruck lovers or, or soulmates or any such thing. It should be somebody with whom you can be very comfortable and somebody who's going to support you. So if you find somebody like that, it's obviously it means that you're lucky. But yeah, this currently there's this attitude that let's have like 10, 15 relationships. Let's have a few breakups and we will learn along the way. If you have this attitude that I'm going to eventually find the right person, you're never going to find the right person. Because you, even if you find what could be the right person, you will always feel that, yeah, there could be some somebody better waiting for me. So, you know, historically, the, these this role of finding a right partner used to be left to the elders, the parents, to the family. Today, it's all broken down because of the, of the breakup of the extended family system. So, yeah, today we have this uh, this uh, this uh, going on in society and it's, it's uh, causing problems. Yeah. So the characteristics you want to look for, firstly, understand marriage is supposed to be hopefully a lifelong thing. Yeah. So look for somebody with whom you can be really comfortable, somebody who will really support you and somebody who is genuinely a friend, a friend. That's that's ideally what you want. And obviously that person should be, you know, good looking and all that. That's also a good quality to, <laughs> to, to have, I, I suppose. Uh, okay. Shall we take maybe a couple more questions? Karan Nalawat is struggling with complex numbers. Complex numbers, it's it's a it's a beautiful field in mathematics. Yeah, obviously, it's 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 definitely something that some people would struggle with. I would say most people would struggle with. So you have to go back to the basics. Start with the very basics of what a complex number is. Yeah, a plus i b or x plus i y or whatever. Yeah, uh, and start with the very basics and practice, practice, practice. You wanna you wanna master mathematics any branch or field of mathematics, you have to solve hundreds, maybe thousands of problems. And the more problems you solve, the more comfortable you get with it. So if you're struggling at a certain level, you have to go back to a couple of levels be 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 before this. Because if you're struggling here, a mathematics is like a building, first floor, second floor, third floor, fourth floor, ground floor. So if you're struggling at, at the fourth floor, maybe the problem is with your fundamentals at floor number two, or floor number one, or maybe at the ground floor itself. So go back revisit those concepts, master that, then progress forward. That's how it is done. That's the logical process of mastering mathematics. At the end of the day, it's about practice, practice, practice. I think anybody can master mathematics, especially Indians. Indians have historically and genetically been really good at math. We have produced the best mathematicians historically. So yeah, all the best, sir. Right. What else do we have? Mm. 
uh, Tejas says, did the Greeks ever conquer Patliputra? It is said that the Greeks uh, once reached Patliputra, maybe in the aftermath of the dissolution of the Shunga Empire, because uh, the Shunga Empire was started by Pushyamitra Shunga. It was founded by Pushyamitra Shunga, the great Senapati of the last Mauryan Empire emperor by assassinating the emperor during a military parade. And it was, I think, Brihadrita who was the last Mauryan emperor. And he was married to a Greek lady, an Indo-Greek lady. And I forget the name of her father. He was uh, one of the kings in, in Gandhara, in one of the Indo-Greek uh, kingdoms. Yeah. Uh, Demetrius, was it? I, I Don't quote me on that. So, uh, Pushyamitra Shunga assassinates Brihadrita, Brihadrita, the last Mauryan emperor. He makes the Mauryan empress's empress a widow. Her father is a king in Gandhara. So he takes the opportunity to come and come to his daughter's rescue because it gives him a viable cause to go to war. And when there is chaos, when the emperor has been assassinated and a new guy is trying to establish power, it's always a good opportunity for an outsider to come in and you know try to conquer territory, bite away at territory. So it is believed that the Greeks did reach Patliputra. So, some accounts do say that I... I do recollect reading some of that. It was not a long-lived phenomenon. Eventually, we know that the Shungas did establish a, a, a strong empire. Yeah, But initially, the Greeks may have reached up to Patliputra. And maybe even in the future, after the Shunga Empire, uh, empire di dissolved, maybe possibly the Greeks maybe once could have come up to Patliputra. Even um, Menander, the great Dharmic Buddhist king, Milinda, he also tried to move into Patliputra. He, he marched eastwards and he was eventually stopped and defeated by the great king Karavela of Kalinga. So yeah, very interesting history. Yeah, very interesting. And this is, this is something nobody bothers to teach you in, 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 in the Indian education system. Um, uh, what else do we have? Let's take one more question somewhere. Okay, did Porus defeat Alexander the, the Greek? Most likely Porus defeated Alexander the Greek. The Greeks will obviously say that Alexander was great, but he was made to turn back with his tail between, between his legs and go back to Babylon where he died of the injuries and wounds he had earned during the attempted invasion of India. Yeah, So most likely, I mean, the, the Russian Admiral Zhukov one of the great admirals of, of, of the USSR, wrote about this. And he said that the uh, Alexander's invasion of India, attempt to inv invade India, most likely ended in defeat at the hands of Porus. Purushottam, Parvateshwar, whatever the name was, yeah? Puru, whatever they call him. The Greeks called him Porus. So most likely it was a defeat. Of course, they, they will never say it was a defeat. They will say that he defeated Porus and then he was magnanimous to him. He said that I'm going to treat you like one king treats another king and all that. But most likely, it was a defeat at the hands of Porus. Most likely. Okay, I think we're going to end it over here. Thank you so much for all these questions. Always wonderfully exciting, interesting, stimulating questions coming in from all of you. Thank you so much for that. Next weekend, I am not going to be able to come live because I'm traveling. I'm going to be in Pondicherry. But uh, let's see if I can do something from there. Possibly. But yeah, most likely not. But I'm going to put up some clips and all that. So this channel will keep on rolling until the next weekend when I'm going to be back live and things will go back to normal. So until then, take care. Thank you so much. And I will see you soon. Thank you. Bye.